Senator, you said this year that a vote for Donald Trump was a vote for hope. What are you hopeful about in the Trump administration? I think if you look at the, uh, the, the state of affairs for paycheck to paycheck folks who feel more disillusioned about American progress, I think you could say to the average person today that there's a reason to be hopeful. Uh, we've elected a president who understands their pain, who uh, has done a great job of communicating specifically to those folks working paycheck to paycheck throughout the South, throughout the, the Rust Belt, and much of the country. Uh, he won, I think, what, 30 states. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that uh, there is a reason to be hopeful and optimistic that there will be a transformation in how we approach our economy. If I'm living paycheck to paycheck, what should I look for coming out of Donald Trump and the Republican Congress? A couple things. Uh, number one, you've got to find a way to rein in some of the red tape or the bureaucracy. Number two, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. That translates into fewer jobs and fewer uh, raises. Number three, under the current administration, we've seen uh, the proliferation of a number of rules that have a negative impact on one's ability to climb the economic ladder, to be promoted. We're going to bring some of those back in and take a second look at those. You've been involved in the Donald Trump's transition. You remember the transition. What's that been like? It's been interesting, fascinating. He's a, he's, he's a very smart and quick-witted person. Uh, Mike Pence, of course, is who, whom I've had the most interaction. He's a, a fantastic leader. I served with him in Congress. I have great, great affection and much respect for uh, Mike Pence and look forward to making contributions. We've talked a little policy, uh, a number of, of positions that have to be filled throughout the uh, administration. What's your feeling about the emerging role and relationship between Pence and Trump in terms of the way they'll run the the administration? It looks like Pence is the little more hands-on, details guy, and Donald Trump is being more sort of chairman of the board type. Is that, how do you see it? I won't pretend to have an insider's perspective completely. I will say that Donald Trump seems to be the visionary. Uh, Mike Pence seems to be the chief operating officer. Having run a business myself for 15 years, you, you, there's a visionary and there's typically a person who does the management side. Uh, I think we'll see uh, Donald Trump turning over some of the control for managing the process to Mike Pence, who of course spent, I think, 12 years in Congress and has been the chief executive of the state. So he understands the nuances that are uh, just going to be a part of the process. You said for Ben Carson being Secretary of, the, of uh, Housing and Urban Development, you said that bringing a neurosurgeon into the housing area will be positive and constructive. What, how so? Well, a couple of things. I, I'm the, uh, I am t today I am the uh, chairman of the subcommittee on housing. One of the things that we've focused on is the fact that so many folks who are poor and, and, and looking for ways to improve their plight live in housing that has not been inspected for years, and yet there sits in an account millions of dollars waiting to be used for inspections. Uh, the current administration has not done that. I think bringing in a fresh pair of eyes and someone who is going to be meticulous about the details is going to be very helpful. I think we'll see millions of dollars that have been sitting there used for inspections to improve the quality of life, to improve the quality of the living space of the folks who are living in, in, in HUD houses. So that's going to be a good thing. The second thing I, I believe is you bring a guy who we all know is brilliant uh, into a space without any uh, set of uh, preconceived ideas. He brings in this fresh perspective, someone who's done very well in life, who actually lived in poverty and now is going to help others who are living in the same place that he lived in get better, that's good news for those folks living there. If you're chairing or you're there for his confirmation hearing, what do you want to hear him say? Well, I want to know his vision for improving the, uh, the use of the resources given to HUD, number one. Number two, how do you actually create a path that transitions people out of you know, government subsidized housing into the, 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 to the free market? That's going to be an important part of the conversation I'll have with him hopefully this week as well as during confirmation. In the 1960s when the HUD secretary was elevated to cabinet rank, it was because of the unrest in the cities. Do you think this is a post where it, uh, housing can be used to, to get at some of those issues that are tensions in our cities today? A major part of what the HUD uh, should focus on is urban development. And I think as a person born in Detroit who has seen the uh, revitalization happen in Detroit, I think he will take with new set of lens the approach that is consistent with how do you rebuild some of the areas of our country that have to be rebuilt for our country, the American family, to prosper together. Uh, I think he will take a very conscientious approach. Hopefully he'll, he'll go on a listening tour 
where he has a chance to listen to some of the success stories, take a look at some of the stories that were supposed to be success stories that never turned out. I think he will take a, a very slow, methodical approach to understanding and appreciating the challenges and some of the deficiencies that are happening. And then you have to translate that into public policy. On the question of urban affairs, have you, I mean, what sense of a priority do you think this is for Donald Trump and based on the campaign he ran? Well, one of the, his closest allies uh, in the last several months of the campaign was Ben Carson. To put one of your closest allies into such a strate strategic position, I think, sends an important signal that he is serious about improving the quality of life in the urban areas. Uh, as uh, Donald Trump said on the campaign trail, there's not much to lose. I would say exactly the opposite. Perhaps there's a lot to gain. Uh, I think Ben Carson reflects what there is to gain. So if on the one hand Ben Carson reflects what there is to gain, let me ask you about Steve Bannon. He was the executive uh, in, in charge of Breitbart News and he said he gave a platform to the alt-right. What the leader of the alt-right is, is they're white nationalists. So if on the one hand Ben Carson sends that signal, what signal does it send that a senior advisor to the president is somebody who boasted about giving a platform to white nationalists? Well, I don't know. I don't know Mr. Bannon at all. Never met him. Never, never have been to the Breitbart uh, site. So <clears throat> it's hard for me to comment on uh, anything other than what I've seen in the press. What I think we'll have to do is judge the Trump administration by what comes out of the Trump administration and, and not the, the uh, collective pieces. Right. But if if Ben Carson sends a signal, surely then Bannon does too as well. What kind of a signal do you think that is? Can't tell you, to be honest with you. I, I, once again, what I know about Ben Carson is through my personal interaction, watching him on the campaign trail. I hosted a town hall that had 5,000 people there to, to listen to Ben Carson. I did something similar for Donald Trump as well, where we had a three, three or 4,000 folks show up at a, at, a, at a meeting for Donald Trump as well. So those two men I've had personal interaction. I. I I'm very cautious to have a conversation about someone whom I have not had a conversation at all, nor have I met or, or been to the right part site. You and Trey Gowdy have started talking to police officers and members of the community. Um, what did you learn in those conversations? Well, there's a, a the, there's an important process to establishing credibility. It starts with a, a conversation that leads to rapport. And once you have some rapport, it's easier to have credibility. Once you uh, understand credibility and have credibility, then it's easy to understand the problems uh, and see the problems from the same prism. Uh, and then you find solutions. And what we've done over the last several meetings is to establish that rapport and credibility. Law enforcement officers working with pastors and other community leaders has been very helpful in South Carolina. And I think we'll see more success as we continue the meetings. The good news is we went in there to the meetings expecting that this would take at quite, quite some time. Uh, we have not been disappointed because we wanted to make sure that first and foremost we had conversations, not about the problem, because what we've seen over the last 40 or 50 years is a deep dive into the problems without any rapport or credibility that has not worked out uh, as, as much as we would like for it to have. Therefore, for us to see progress, I think it's going to take uh, us establishing that rapport and uh, finding credibility before we address the problems. And now we're getting to the point where we're uh, being able to see and, and talk about the programs that have been effective in de-escalating situations. We're able to bridge the gap and talk about community policing. We're going to have uh, law enforcement officers uh, bring along for ride along, so to speak, pastors and community leaders who are now volunteering to participate in that process. These are all good signs because at the end of the day, if we want better policing in communities, the community has a responsibility to understand their officers. And if you can understand the job of the average officer, I think you'll have more deference and, and more empathy for what's happening and vice versa as well. So that's what we hope to accomplish. And I think we're on the road. Is it possible to build that empathy uh, other than through the patient process you've been doing? In other words, nationally through national policy? Well, there certainly are some uh, grants that have been provided to, I think, six cities are going through a test pilot of how to get community policing uh, to be more in vogue, so to speak. Gary, Indiana uh, was, a, was highlighted in a story in the Wall Street Journal on November, December 1st, which talks about the success, 85% African-American city that is seeing a, a steep drop in the, the amount of crime and it's seen an incredible increase and the positive uh, relationships between officers in the community where they serve. And that's been a, a classic example of some of the success. I think body cameras 
are obviously a part of the arsenal that will be helpful into understanding what's happening uh, in stops. When you talk about this empathy, this two-way relationship that has to exist, Donald Trump ran for president saying, I'm going to be the law and order president. How is that, how does that come across in the community? How do they hear that? Well, I think people define it differently, law and order. Uh, I, I see law and order as a good, constructive part of what makes a community safer. Uh, so my approach and my perspective is that a law and order type of an environment will be conducive for a higher quality of life. You'll see more folks uh, hopefully out in the streets enjoying their neighborhoods and the, than you have in the past. And you'll have more law enforcement officers understanding and appreciating the communities by spending time getting to know those communities when there is no incident to come and investigate. So I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about that concept of law and order. What some people heard when, when he talked about law and order was a kind of uh, force first, a kind of escalation of fear about the community, about the inner cities. Uh, and some people believe that creates a, a state of fear that works against all the work you've been doing to try and create empathy. Well, I, I, would, I would hope not. And certainly people hear different things when they hear law and order. My hope is that what we'll do over time is we'll see that progress has not been stymied under a Trump administration, but we'll see that it has prospered. It's, we're going to have to be uh, very careful in what we do and what we say uh, in, in circumstances so as to bring people together and not see, sow seeds that are poisonous. Donald Trump knows how to put on a good show. We saw him do it with Carrier uh, and uh, not only protected jobs, but sent a message to working people uh, all across the country. What could he do on these sets of issues having to do with community relationships with police that would be have that kind of same kind of message sending capability? Well, one of the fastest things he could do that would bring about great change is to embrace our opportunity agenda that we've been working on for the last three or four years. It starts with understanding that every zip code in this country needs quality education. And if there's not a quality school in your neighborhood, we should make sure that there is one, whether that's charter schools or virtual schools or magnet schools or private schools. Uh, well, I've traveled the country and seen some amazing uh, uh, practices that are starting to manifest uh, throughout the country. One in Philadelphia where a charter school is now the neighborhood school. So we're seeing some success stories. That's the number one thing he can do. Number two, realize that every student does not want to go to college. So having a dual track in education, uh, you're too young to remember shop in oh, high no, school. I took shop. Uh, <laughs> now we know that you can, you can be on Face the Nation if you take shop. This is great. <laughs> so the only way you can get there. <laughs> <laughs> so having that shop, that dual track, is a really important part of apprenticeship programs something that I believe that Donald Trump will, will focus on as president. But let's think bigger. Uh, supporting your legislation, what you've been working on here, that's one way. But is there something you can think of that would be symbolic, that would send that kind of strong signal that he sent with the carrier operation? Well, I think obviously uh, spending time uh, is perhaps the thing that you do that is, doesn't require legislation. It's how you use your time. We spend, uh, we are intentional, intentional about using my time in a way that says to communities that have perhaps felt disenfranchised from the conservative movement, we care, we go there, we spend time, we listen. We don't come with solutions first. My agenda was, de was designed around the questions and the concerns of, of community members. So if Donald Trump will take the time and spend some time in, in Cleveland and Detroit and in Charleston and other places, I think he'll find that people are receptive to the person who invests their time, energy, and then their talents into solving problems. Uh, you gave a speech uh, back in July after the, the uh, shootings in Baton Rouge and in Dallas, and you talked about while there's so many officers that do good, you had experienced and seen those that did not. Uh, in the course of one year, I've been stopped seven times by law enforcement officers. Not four, not five, not six, but seven times in one year as an elected official. I have felt the anger, the frustration, the sadness, and the humiliation that comes with feeling like you're being targeted for nothing more than being just yourself. What's been the reaction to that speech since then? I tell you, well, number one, I think it's opened the eyes to a lot of folks who perhaps have listened to the uh, cries and the screams and the shouts of others. Uh, and disregarded those. I think perhaps our, our speaking out, my speaking out on the issue, 
has validated the concerns of many African-American males who have gone through similar situations, but it has said to others on the other side that perhaps there's some validity to the issue and we should take a second look. I've had a number of folks who have come up to me and thanked me for uh, coming forward with the truth as I have experienced it. Uh, many of those folks have been white folks who have just uh, not necessarily heard the, the challenges of other folks. I've had other folks who have been uh, you know, pushing back on the fact that I came forward on uh, and made any comments. The conversation over race and particularly where policing gets involved get, gets hot pretty fast. How bad has the pushback been? Is it? I mean, I think some folks believe that, you know, uh, it's been fairly aggressive without any question, but listen, uh, the way I look at it is you either do the right thing for the right reasons or you don't. Uh, speaking out on something that is real is the right thing. Uh, folks who uh, believe that I'm, I'm feeding into a narrative, that's their problem, not mine. Uh, so I'm, I'm comfortable with where I am. It's not necessarily been a comfortable ride or journey, but it's been a, a necessary journey. But the good news is that disproportionately speaking, the response has been tremendously positive. The story you're trying to tell is, it goes back, it seems to me, to this idea of empathy, understanding that there are two views here, that there are different experiences, and that that is the beginning before you can even get to policy. Well, that's something I try to explain to both sides, so to speak, in, my, uh, in our meetings with Trey Gowdy. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. Said differently, even those folks who, uh, to be blunt, the black community leaders need to spend time doing ride alongs with officers. You need to understand and appreciate the milliseconds that you may have in making decisions. You need to walk in those shoes for a little while. And by the same token, I, I encourage and sometimes aggressively encourage, spend some time in neighborhoods. I grew up in many of those neighborhoods. I was a poor kid in a single parent household living in a very small house. Uh, I understand the pain and the suffering, the challenges and the frustration. You gotta know the people that you, you are responsible or placed in charge of. Do you have a, a suggestion then for what to do about our national uh, break that has happened after this uh, election? There are a lot of people who feel not only that Donald Trump doesn't represent them, but people of color who believe that he actively played on fears in the African-American community, in, in, uh, in basically in urban areas, played on fears to get elected. How do you bridge that gap? Well, anyone who watched this election and did not see that fear was a part of both sides of the aisle missed the election. I think we would have the same conversation had Hillary won, by the way, just to, perhaps a different perspective, but the same conversation of fear and frustration. So what I say to folks is, let's give Mr. Trump a chance. Let's, let's gauge progress uh, in his administration by what he does. I always want folks to give me a shot to prove that I'm either going to live up to my words or, or, or not fulfill them at all. I think Donald Trump uh, deserves the same uh, time to prove his mettle, so to speak. Uh, and I'm going to hold him accountable like every single American should hold all of our presidents accountable. I guess the difference with Hillary Clinton is people would have been very scared and afraid, but it wouldn't have been based on the color of your skin. Which is no, it would probably have been more philosophical uh, type of fear uh, and, and, and uh, perhaps intimidation if you listen to the comments that she made on the campaign trail. But look, there's no doubt that we have a country that is hurting, that race relations have, I think, are worse now than they were eight years ago. I think there's something we can do about that. So myself and Trey Gowdy, we are venturing to do that in South Carolina. I hope to be a part of the, the national conversation on having the American family see the family as one family unit and look for ways to not disenfranchise any part of the American family, but bring all of us together, which I think is a good place to start. You said uh, that you wept when you watched Walter Scott turn and run away and got sh get shot and killed from the back. So what's your reaction to the, to the way that trial is going now? Well, I tell you, I, I, I look at that and uh, the good news is if the reports are accurate, 11 jurors saw a reason to convict him, Mr. Slager, of something. Uh, I, I am hopeful that with a new jury we'll see the right response come out and I'm also uh, interested in watching the federal process play out as well. So from my perspective, the uh, response from uh, folks who live in South Carolina is something that we can all be proud of. Anything that tries to inflame the lack of a response is just inconsistent with what's in the best interest of this country. 
Charleston's had a, a tough couple of years Absolutely. with Walter Scott and the Mother Emanuel Church. What, tell where are things now? Well, I think our, our, our we, there certainly are sensitive times. Uh, there are there are levels of frustration without any question. There's a lot of hope though. Uh, there was a prayer uh, visual uh, Monday morning uh, before the final verdict came out, and these are pastors coming together, African American and white pastors coming together, asking our community to show the same type of resolve that we did after the Walter Scott shooting, after the. Mother Emanuel shooting. We are one cohesive Charleston family and we say we're Charleston strong. So the goal is to remain confident in the judicial process. Uh, I am confident that, the, that justice will be done. Uh, and uh, I think even uh, Mrs. Judy Scott says she's praying and, and believing that this process will continue and that there will be justice. I'm, I'm confident that there will be justice. There's a new president. Republicans are in charge in the House and the Senate. What's your prediction? What's, what should people expect uh, starting in January? Well, more optimism, pain and suffering, uh, and a long process. Why pain and suffering? Well, because we have 51 votes today. Uh, we need 60 to move legislation through the Senate. So the fact that we have all three levers of government sends a sign that the party starts now. We're going to get things done tomorrow. And we're going to be able to get some things done, but we should, we should caution people not to have expectations that are unrealistic. Senator, you're lowering expectations. Well, I'm setting realistic expectations. Uh, I, I certainly w woke up uh, Wednesday morning shocked and amazed. I was up when uh, he won, about 3 o'clock in the morning. I woke up at 7.30 and I was still in shock. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that we have a real opportunity on our hands. So none of us should suggest that we're going to move like a hot knife through butter uh, headed towards what we define as progress. The one thing I believe you'll hear from Donald Trump, and I think you'll get it from our Congress as well, is we better be very careful to build an agenda that draws America together. Uh, we learned under Obamacare specifically that legislation, when you shove through a, leg a legislative vehicle uh, that requires all one party votes to get it done, that is not in the best interest of the country. So if we repeal Obamacare, the replacement, we're going to look for ways to attract folks to the conversation because the repeal process is the easy part. The replacement is going to take a, a bipartisan coalition. And I would hate to think that there are folks in, the, in, in this political environment that would jeopardize uh, some folks in this country over partisan politics. You think the Democrats will work with you? Well, if they don't, then they're jeopardizing the very health of some of their constituents. All right. Senator Scott, thanks so much. Yes, sir. Look forward to talking with you again.